like a canteen of water found in the desert, I have stumbled upon a good one. Hellraiser. Finally. It's it's been tough these past couple of scary mania reviews, but thankfully Hellraiser is just as good as I have always heard that it is. It's a freaky, freaky little movie, but more on that in a minute. But first I want to toss it to one third of the Small Talk podcast. Jacob Collins from 3D Movie Cinema. Jacob, take it away. Welcome to 3D Movie Cinema, the only show that's three dimensions away from Hellraiser, crossing over the Hellraiser remake and being called Hellraiser, Battle of the Pinhead. I'm your host, 3D Jake, and today we're looking at Hellraiser, released in 1987. I just want to say thank you so much to Ryan Cam for inviting me on his YouTube channel, so that way I can cover this beloved classic film. This is one of my favorite uh, Halloween films to watch, and it's my favorite Clyde Barker film. I think it is a fantastic movie, and I watch it. The last time I watched it was while I'm moving out of my mom's house. And then I, re I think, actually, that's a lie. I rewatched it like a couple months ago. It's just such a good film. It is, I think, a movie that you should watch if you ever plan on going to film school. If you're ever just going to make a monster film, I think it does deals with paranoia and gore and practical effects real well. Um, I urge you all to watch this movie. Um, Hellraiser is directed by, written and directed by Clyde Barker and stars Ashley Lawrence, Claire Higgins, John Chapman, Andrew Robinson, and Doug Bradley. The movie is essentially about a family that lives, is supposed to live, they live in the, it's the UK, but like we're not supposed to know that. You know, and it, they live in the you know, America, really it's the UK. Uh, and so basically they moved there and the brother basically it, what, used to live there and he was basically trying to have all the sexual pleasures in the world and he basically got tiresome. So then of course when a fortune teller gives him a the laminate configuration box, he basically opens it up and then summers, summons the Cenobites, and then they rip his flesh apart. And then months later, the brother moves in and he cuts his hand on a bed and smothers his blood all over there, which reforms the brother slowly but surely. And the brother needs flesh to basically make himself whole again. The movie is the movie is essentially about that everyone sees everyone gets the misconception on the movie that if you when you see pinhead on the box and he's like you know like they think that is like the killer of the movie or something and pinhead's more of a i wouldn't say supporting character in the movie rather than the main villain because he's not the main villain you know uh, you know the sean chapman is the main villain of the movie which you know is larry's brother you know larry's brother and so I think that's what really people get that misconception. Uncle Frank is Larry is Larry's brother, you know. Is you know Frank, I always call him Uncle Frank. You know, it's Frank. It's Frank Cotton, Larry Cotton's brother. Larry Frank is the main villain of the movie. And so people get that misconception when they watch Hellraiser that Pinhead's the main villain when Pinhead's not. And I would say Pinhead doesn't really become the main villain until Hellraiser three. Like he really is mostly like each film has a different villain. You know, in a way, because Pinhead is not really a villain. He's basically, think of him like, a, you know, he's basically the police in the, in the, in the, Britain, in the Libreth world, you know, in the Cenobites world, you know, like that, they're basically the police and they basically keep, when you open it, you're opening their world and they're basically, they take you because you basically open the portal and then they're taking you into this world, you know, like the Viathan is like, you know, this, you know, and so basically... You know, and these people don't realize that, you know, when you're going to this world, that is like, you know, like, and so the book and the movie, you know, this book is based off the novel by Clive, the novella by Clive Barker, which the book is really sh short. Like, you could probably read this in under 30 minutes. I mean, it's like the, about the same size as the Goosebumps book. Like, it's really, really short. I had the book over there, and it's really, really short. Like, I read it several times, and I would say probably a Goosebumps book is shorter. <laughs> it's like shorter, than, it's like longer than that. Well, I mean, the book is really short, but it's a really good short story that I really like. Um, I will say that, you know, there are some minor differences in the movie. Like, for instance, like, Larry Cotton doesn't have a daughter. He has a, a, a good friend of his that really likes him. And so that's like, you know, Kirsty Cotton is her, you know, is the, is the is a friend of Larry Cotton that likes him. But in the movie, they change it to daughter. And also how... In the movie, they kind of portray more or less Frank as a junkie, 
that you know needs a new fix while in the movie well in the book he's more of a sex addict who has had every pleasure and done everything but he really wants to fulfill that sexual pleasure more so i can't say really what he does but well, let's just say he uses his eggplant and he shoots his frosting on the floor once he opens leviathan and then of course the after he gets feels so much pleasure then the hooks can rip his flesh apart and then of course when his brother you know cuts his hand and then the brothers the blood mixes with his frosting and then reforms him again just like in the movie but they change it in the movie because some people don't want to watch that and it's been kind of weird thinking about her brother mixing with a brother's blood mixing with a brother's frosting and making another, another brother again yeah that would be weird and you know and also the cenobite is more of like a female looking cenobite in the book in the novella where like i would say in the remake of hellraiser they that she uh, that cenobite is more accurately portrayed in that movie you know to the accurate to the novella versus in this movie is portrayed by a close friend of clive barker's doug bradley who wears basically a lot, a lot of leather, late leather, and uh, more of like a BDSM outfit, and you know it has like you know the pinheads, which I know it's called the Hell Hell Priest or Lead Cenobite, but you know, and then of course until Hellraiser three, people just start calling him Pinhead, and so and you know what, that's fine because I mean I like Pinhead, he's a cool dude, and also this this fran this movie just started launched a huge franchise because this these were starting out as independent films that you know. Clyde Barker made and it just has so many unique things about it that it has like you know this like puzzle box that you open and then basically it summons you into another universe a realm that is like basically pain that you have to sit there and like use this pleasure and it's really messed up it's like you know the worst pleasure in the world and I will say one and two were like the definitive story because they concludes the story of Clyde Barker the one and two are Clyde Barker's film the rest are basically like I know Clyde Barker did technically write three, but he they, they the script was heavily rewritten. You know him and his, uh, him and Peter what's his name the script was heavily rewritten. But then and also with part four and then of course you know also Hellraiser has been a huge franchise. I mean it's got like a, two novels I think and then of course it's got a he's a character in Dead by Daylight and he got a remake and he's even got a music video by Motorhead. I mean come on how awesome is that. I mean, just it's so great that you know Hellraiser is so you know it's so like bet you a big kind of, kind of thing based off this movie. And I know a lot of people get disappointed watching this movie and thinking that Pinhead's gonna show up and raise hell. Instead, he just is like he's more of a police figure, and Frank is the villain. And I do like the idea that it's just a woman who really is in love, like she's in love with like another man, and like literally the dude is like they he moves in with her and everything, and then she's like I'm in love with like I'm in love with your brother. She's in like. But she doesn't tell him that. And then she's killing men for the review of the brother. And then at the end, the brother just like, I don't need you. And also, to make it matters worse, he she kills her husband, which is the guy, which is Frank's brother. And he wears his own flesh. I mean, that's just so crazy. And you know, I think that's just so freaking crazy about that. You know, and I, I, I mean, man, Pinhead has so many great quotes like, "We have such sights to show you." and there's just so many great quotes about this movie and you know I even have like a Nika figure of Pinhead and I also like you know I have the laminate configuration box and I have the, the movies and I have the thing I will recommend Ryan do not watch all the movies because some of them are really terrible because they were just scripts that were the basically the Weinsteins had scripts for the movies that for, for movies that they just turned into Hellraiser movies because they were like it was like a situation where they got their run rights running out they need to make a movie. They have this direct-to-video script, and they're like, "All right, re get hired like a ghostwriter to say, hey, just change a few things and make it Hellraiser." That's literally like five through, five through, five through. I think Hell, five through like six or five through seven. Yeah, five through six. I think is always that. Like the first, or no, five through seven. Five through seven were just spec scripts that they just wrote. They were like spec scripts for other movies, and then the Weinsteins were running out of the rights, so they would say, all right, change this a little bit and make it Hellraiser 5. Change this a little bit and make it Hellraiser 6. Change this a little bit and make it Hellraiser 7. And that's what they just kept doing. And so, like, the first three, first four movies are meant to be Hellraiser films, and then five through seven 
are actually movies that are not that were not meant to be Hellraiser movies. Especially five. Five just feels like it's like this is a Hellraiser film. Are you serious? You know, I mean, I mean seriously. But like, I really enjoyed this movie, especially because this is like Clyde Barker at his finest. And this we 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 went and got Nightbreed, Lord of Illusions. Uh, without like this movie, I mean, I or we I think Clyde Barker really did a great job directing, especially, and especially the stop motion scene when the brother reforms and they just, they just melted a skeleton and they replayed the footage backwards is how they did it, and like the story just about it, you know, and especially the end of the movie with the dra- when he turns the homeless guy turns into a giant like dragonish skeleton, that was not in the original script at all in, or in the book. What happened was they said they just needed a more a better ending, so Clyde Barker were running out of money, so they were just like let's do that and Clyde Barker is like all right <laughs> so let's do that and so that kind of how it happened and also the whole movie was shot in the UK and that's why a lot of people are like British and so like you know and originally like they were trying to say it was like oh Boston area when really it's not you know like both the first two movies were both shot in the UK and so and I think the only person that was American I think was like Andrew Robinson and uh and uh Ashley Lawrence everybody else was British <laughs> and so I mean, but I really enjoy this movie. This movie's a well-made film for Clyde Barker. I kind of wish he would have directed the second one, but it's still a great sequel that directed. And this movie is really well done. I like all the, the cast of the movie. I think the acting is well done, the direction, the score by, you know, Christopher Young, I think is yeah, Christopher Young, who would go on to score Spider-Man 2 and 3, and who also, I think, scored, did he score, I think, like, another Sam Raimi film? I think he scored another one. But, I mean, he's such a good, you know, uh, composer and everything. And I think he did a good job in Spider-Man 2 and 3. Especially, I could tell he direct, he scored the Doc Ock hospital sequence in Spider-Man 2. Cause, and the Sandman. I mean, just come on. That's Christopher Young at his finest. And so, you know, and basically, I know that some people say Danny Elfman scored Spider-Man 2. No, Stan Elfman left Spider-Man 2. And Christopher Young, after a disagreement with Sam Raimi, and then Christopher Young came in and scored the rest of Spider-Man 2. And so I, I really enjoy this movie. Um, it's a great horror film to watch. It's not really a horror. I would say it's kind of, it's just more gore than it is horror. But it's a well-made film that I think it's it's an art house horror film. And if you do not have that type of taste, I don't think you will like it. But I really think it, if I had to give this movie a grade, I'm giving it an A. Thank you so much, Ryan. Hellraiser, a film by Clive Barker. We'll tear your soul apart. Jacob's channel is linked in the description. Go give him a subscribe there. It's great stuff. But Hellraiser was actually a British film. It was based on the book The Hellbound Heart and was directed by its author, Clive Barker. It tells the story of a man who finds a puzzle box, the Rubik's Cube from Hell, if you will. They hold the Cenobites, basically they're angels to some, devils to others, and they use pain and pleasure as, well, pretty much the same thing. They turn this guy into basically a pile of guts living under this house, which the guy's brother just so happens to move into looking for him along with his with his family. They all move into the house to look for the brother. But, well, the Cenobites are, well, one step ahead. In my research, I found that despite how gnarly this movie actually was, it was supposed to be even more hardcore, so much so that Clive Barker had to go into the edit and trim stuff down because it would have gotten an X rating. Kind of similar to kind of similar to other horror movies of the past how they were originally supposed to be so much like worse in terms of gore that they basically would have been given an x rating which would have been a kiss of death if you will but barker went back in and basically turned it into an r rating still very near the knuckle and still very gruesome but can you imagine a more hardcore version of this movie lord knows i can't despite the content though the Cenobites are not in the movie all that much. You can count the number of scenes that Pinhead has in this movie on one hand and have fingers to spare. So believe me when I say that despite their kind of absence, if you will, this is still a good movie with a very compelling mystery. This puzzle box is just freaky on its own, but then when you meet the Cenobites, you just look at them and you just go, 
oh 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 um yeah that 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 looks pretty gruesome that the movie does a good job of keeping the Cenobites like very like in the shadows to where you don't truly know what you're dealing with you see it and you just go how are they enjoying this like seriously the most known of the Cenobites is Pinhead, played by Doug Bradley. In my research, I found that the makeup that he was wearing was so hard for him to work with at times that he would literally trip over his own clothes and could barely see through the black contact lenses that he wore in his eyes. And looking at it, it's one of the more iconic looks in horror history. But at the same time, you can look at it and just go... Yeah, that's not exactly practical, that. It's kind of the same thing when you hear all those stories about Lon Chaney Jr., about how he had to be pinned to a chair for hours on end while the Wolfman makeup was slowly applied. It's one of those things where the scares outweigh the practicality, I suppose. But the Cenobites don't really, don't really dominate the movie. They're basically in about a handful of scenes, and the rest of the time... It's this mystery, and it's a pretty compelling mystery. It's a bit of a shame, too, because the Cenobites pretty much are the only thing that is known from this movie, and the rest is just kind of cast aside. It's like watching the original Friday the 13th, going into it thinking you're going to see Hockey Mask Jason when Jason doesn't get the Hockey Mask until Part 3. It's a bit of a weird flex, but the movie, I think, does a solid job of effectively creeping you out there were a string of sequels afterwards a lot of them going straight to dvd and we just got one this past year on hulu which was directed by david bruckner so yeah hellraiser is making a bit of a comeback i suppose hellraiser is definitely not for everyone let's not get that twisted your mileage is definitely going to vary but if you got the stomach for it i give it a recommendation